welcome to Muse Meets 2022. I'm Kelly Squazzo, Director of Publisher Relations and Content Development for Project Muse. We are very happy to present our second Muse Meets event that connects the scholarly publisher, librarian, and researcher communities. Project Muse is in a wonderful position to work closely with so many stakeholders with a common interest in ensuring discoverability and engagement with nonprofit scholarly publishing digital content. Muse Meets 2022 is a free event to provide an opportunity for these voices to come together to discuss topics that resonate with everyone in our communities. And by hosting virtually, we can bring many, many more people into the conversation. In fact, we have over 650 registrants from across the globe. We've got such a great event planned for the next day and a half. We do hope there's something for everyone in our programming and that you leave Muse Meets with something learned, an idea sparked, or a new connection made. All sessions are open to registrants, so please check out the schedule on the Muse Meets webpage. There, you'll also find pre-recorded Muse staff video updates, Muse briefs, as well as our code of conduct and land acknowledgement. If you can't make it to all the live sessions, recording links will be sent after the event. And we do hope you'll join us at the various networking sessions so we can put faces to names and continue the conversations. Just click on the Zoom link on the Muse Meets webpage at the start time. But first, to kick off our event, I'm thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker. Karen Wolf is historian of early America, the Beatrice and Julio Mario Santo Domingo director and librarian of the John Carter Brown Library and professor of history at Brown University. She is the author or editor of award-winning scholarly books and essays, and she regularly writes for general audience publications about history, archives, and the importance of humanities scholarship. And it's that work on humanities that truly reflects the core mission of Project Muse, ensuring that the future of humanities research is not just sustainable, but innovative and widely accessible. There will be plenty of time for audience questions toward the end of the hour, so please enter them into the Q&A chat. I'm delighted to welcome Karen Wolf. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's, um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so grateful for this invitation. Um, I thank you and Wendy both. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation, particularly at the end of this hour. I just wanna make sure that my audio is okay, but I am guessing that it is because I can see Kelly nodding. Excellent, okay. <gasps> like everyone, I've spent more than a couple of years at Zoom land now. And like everyone, there is still a little bit of um, tweaking that has to happen in every um, Zoom environment. So it's a special privilege for me to address Muse Meets um, today, in part because Project Muse was originally a project between, or a partnership between Johns Hopkins University Press and the Hopkins Eisenhower Library. And it launched literally just after I finished my graduate work at Hopkins. So I have some kind of Hopkins appreciation and nostalgia for Muse, even though Muse now is so much um, beyond that and such an incredible kind of um, nonprofit collaborative among so many other presses and, and partners. So uh, Wendy and Kelly um, didn't ask me to start there, um, but it is important um, context for what I wanna talk about today, which is the urgent work of the humanities in higher education and in public life. For the biggest challenges that we face, and for our most important ambitions and commitments. If this were a different year, um, even last year, I think, or a different month, maybe even just a few months ago, I might have written a different talk for today. I've been passionate about the vital importance of the humanities and especially my home discipline of history. And I've expressed that in a variety of different venues over the last years. And I've enjoyed so much learning from so many people in this community about those subjects. I've read a lot, I've spoken, I've written about my concern that our shared interest in scholarly communication can be driven in unproductive ways by the perceived needs of STEM disciplines and STEM research and publishing practices. And that the view of science as the standard for research and for scholarly communication structures is at best imbalanced. At last year's Muse Meets, I was on a great panel where I definitely learned more than I shared for sure, uh, where we talked about, among other things, the relationship of our mutual um, connections across scholarly communication. And I think um, if I had written this talk just after that panel, I have extended my remarks and said something quite different. But you know, we are now in the third year of a pandemic that has killed a million of my fellow Americans, more than 6 million people worldwide. 
It's a pandemic that has further exposed wretched inequality and it's sought, it's wrought terrible trauma and grief. Another war is raging. This one in all its common inhumanity showing again, just how cumulative mass violence is, how voracious authoritarianism is and how steeped in nationalist pieties. People are starving. They're seeking shelter. We are always living in a historical context, but it does feel right now, I have to say in this third year of pandemic, the context keeps accumulating. In the first months of this pandemic, I was in the midst of a conversation with a senior colleague, a senior historian about the vitally important work that historians of medicine were doing to illuminate how epidemic diseases always exacerbated inequalities showing us, for example, for the American case, how the yellow fever epidemic of 1793 in Philadelphia, or the so-called Spanish flu of the World War I era hit hardest, always communities of color, poorer communities, that we could track how pandemic would proceed by better understanding how power was already distributed in a society. And this colleague said to me, <laughs> Karen, please don't say that history is as important as medicine. And I have thought about that so much over the last two years. History isn't as important as medicine. You can't eat the humanities. The humanities can't assess your illness or treat your injury. And the humanities can't win a war. And not because I'm not grateful more than grateful, in fact, I know that my own case of COVID recently was much reduced in impact because of the incredible work of scientists to get uh, vaccines to us and public health officials, um, really the unbelievable work of healthcare workers around the world. But you know, I don't believe that history isn't as important as medicine. <laughs> I've thought and thought and thought about this, but I just don't believe that. And I guess that's what this talk is about. So I want to pause for a minute here on a work of poetry with historical significance. In January of 2009, what seemed like really a lifetime ago, uh, Elizabeth Alexander stood to speak poetry into the historical record. The history of inaugural poetry is itself interesting. According to the Library of Congress, there have been six poets who have read at a presidential inauguration, beginning with Robert Frost at that of John F. Kennedy in 1961. And then of course, most recently, Amanda Gorman at Joe Biden's inaugural in 2021. But when Elizabeth Alexander stepped forward to read, she was stepping into history, not as the first black woman to read at an inauguration, that was Maya Angelou at Bill Clinton's in 1997, but as the first to mark the inauguration of a black president of the United States. It was such a moment. And it seems a thing now you know, on social media or in public writing to note how naive so many were to think of Obama's presidency as marking a decisive change in both American politics and American fortunes. But Alexander captured in this poem, even then a sense of tempered, even wary observation about what that might mean. I am no scholar of literature and I am no great reader of poetry, but I know this. Alexander had history in mind, both the history of black people in America, struggling and striving and living and loving, and the history that was being made from that podium. I have thought about this one stanza repeatedly. We encounter each other in words, words spiny or smooth, whispered or declaimed, words to consider and reconsider. The humanities are about the power of language and about the power of language and culture to reflect and to galvanize humanity. The humanities are an assemblage of ways of knowing and of sharing that knowledge. The humanities are data-driven analyses that the humanities are poetry. The humanities are not a subject, though there are endless significant, even critical topics in the humanities, but a mode of inquiry and thought that provides us with the way to be human together. I'm not going to say anything new here today, nothing that others have not said in more concise or expert terms or observed in more cogent frameworks, but I did want to create an opportunity to pause, 
to think through some of what is happening around us and what we might make of it, how the humanities helps us actually to take that pause, insists that we pause and helps us make something of the world around us. So we are all here today in the midst of multiple exigencies, the pandemic and authoritarianism, yes, climate crisis, but I also speak myself from a conviction that information integrity, education, and the collaborative production of knowledge is necessary to healthy democratic institutions. Education is such a core project of democracy. At every level, we know now that it's under stress, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. We know that education is actually approached through dividing knowledge into domains, and we know that that fact of division creates hierarchies among them. That is in some ways why science seems urgent um, and the humanities seem like it won't feed us. We also know that knowledge is political, that what we come to know is filtered through the structures of power in the environment around us in the societies in which we live. And we know profoundly that we need all knowledge by any measure, we cannot live by science alone. Humanity needs the humanities. Now, in the world of scholarly communications, libraries and publishers are often seen to have sometimes opposing interests. In the world of research and publication, sometimes STEM and the humanities are understood to be opposing. But actually, we know differently. We know that nonprofit publishers exemplified by university presses and libraries work together to make the humanities accessible. We know that developing humanities perspectives is the collaborative work of a full spectrum of professionals working in different positions within libraries, within and beyond the academy, at publishers, at aggregators, at platforms and more thinking critically about the human condition and refining expert expressions based in research. And we also know all of us working in those many different professional situations that our work has extensive and intensive value. So those are my propositions today. Let's talk about crisis <laughs> because at some level, it feels like the context that we're talking about, the big ones that I mentioned, pandemic, war, authoritarianism, climate, these are the big ones. And that there are more immediate contexts in which all of us here today are operating. For example, the crisis of the humanities and the related crises of higher education. There are some specific contexts that matter here that I think we wanna think about. That is that the so-called crisis of the humanities, and I think there is a reasonable argument to be made that at some level the humanities are sort of always in crisis. We could think about the kind of history of the humanities and how it has risen along with research universities in the, across the 20th century and identified as a research endeavor and think about just that very fact of being placed within higher education research put the humanities, as it were, in an awkward position, particularly vis-a-vis -vis what was rising then to be understood as a national interest in science. But in any case, it does feel to us like humanities are always in crisis. That's absolutely connected to these other problems which don't have, um, that are not absent historical context. That is the problems of higher education public disinvestment from higher education, which has increased the incredible cost to students of attending colleges and universities. The fact of student debt, which is gone hand in glove with public disinvestment, where previously public investment came in the form of state legislatures pledging support for universities. Now students are expected to bear the majority often of the cost of their education, and they often are carrying that through debt. The debt crisis is intense. We've seen just in recent uh, weeks, even, how uh, the relief of debt has such an extraordinary impact. We know from studies 
that the impact on families and then on our community economies is profound of relieving that debt. But relieving that debt on individuals is extraordinarily impactful as well. So public disinvestment and student death, uh, debt. The intensifying disparities among institutions. I was uh, I have cited here a couple of um, a couple of sources, but you know I was also taken with a recent piece by Andrew Del Banco in The Nation about whether the pandemic has in fact created such disparity of higher education institutions has put, for example, regional comprehensive universities in such peril that we may not see recovery. The disparity between the elite. Ivy League and other um, uh, the flagship public universities um, and struggling universities, particularly small private colleges, and the rise of the business major. Here is a phenomenon I want to address because I think it's really important to think about how universities have come to provide different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of knowledge domains. I've focused thus far on thinking about the humanities and science, which are themselves incredible generalities, but they're not the only two knowledge domains that are being delivered um, as curriculum in universities. The rise of the business major is incredible. More students now are graduating from colleges with business majors than any other um, by some measures. It's also the case um, that there is a sense that, at least in surveys, that the reason for that is an expectation of increased earning potential. And although surveys don't show that to be the case, business majors may make a modest amount more about five years out of college over their lifetime, humanities majors do just as well. In other words, there's no argument for one major in college versus another. One is no more practical than the other, but it does persist this notion so the crisis of the humanities doesn't exist outside of these other historical contexts. If we stepped back and we looked at the kind of long history of the 20th century and where the humanities fit, as I've suggested, it has to do with the rise of research universities, particularly in the middle of the 20th century. This is a short history, actually, not a long history. So when we say the humanities have always been in crisis, we really mean a matter of decades. If we think across millennia, the humanities have always been with us. The humanities have always served us. There are organizations which are doing incredibly important work to understand the humanities in American life. I'm referencing here uh, the work of the Humanities Indicators Project. Uh, the Humanities Indicators Project arose precisely in response to the Science and Engineering Indicators Project, which is a project of many, many decades uh, at the National Science Foundation. Humanities Indicators is a project of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So while uh, science and engineering indicators are from uh, a, a federal agency, the National Science Foundation, Humanities Indicators are um, a project of the American Academy. The Humanities Indicators collects data about um, K through 12 and higher education. and gives us all kinds of different metrics for thinking about the humanities. And I just wanna point here to uh, this question about bachelor degree um, completions in the humanities. And as you see, if we look across the long durée, the humanities don't necessarily look in crisis, but what we do see is that we see um, that the humanities now are the smallest share of bachelor's degrees since 1949. That's pretty remarkable, pretty stunning. I wanna call out some other information within that change in how the humanities function. And of course, uh, let me just say one other thing too, that if we looked at different kinds of institutions, which the Humanities Indicators Project does, we would see differences. This is aggregated um, data here. Um, if we pick out particular humanities disciplines and particular humanities projects and we, um, and we zero in here, we see some really startling and discouraging numbers. From an MLA study in 2019, for example, we see that just in the few years between 2013 and 2016, a particular a year of particularly acute cuts to higher education, 651 foreign language programs were cut in US, US higher education um, institutions. 
Between the business, the rise of the business major and the cuts to language programs, I think we see a lot of short-termism in thinking about the value of humanities versus other kinds of research and education approaches. I am confident that many of us have heard in our own institutions, whether we're working inside or outside of the academy, how important it is for us to now font, locate and support those who speak Russian, Ukrainian, and other Eastern European languages. And also many of us who know in institutions where we have worked or do work, that those languages have been cut in recent years. In other words, you know, just at the very moment when we need them, we have suffered from having lost that capacity. It was the same with Arabic. It has been the same with other languages, short-term thinking. So what about the public humanities? The humanities don't only exist in higher education. Um, in fact, you might make an argument that the humanities exist um, more fully, are expressed more fully um, outside of colleges and universities. After all, poetry does not require a university uh, to compose, to read, to appreciate, to enjoy. History is learned um, actually much more profoundly outside of a university setting. So I wanna just make a note about some uh, key resources and some key efforts to try to understand uh, the public humanities. I'm focused here on history. Of course, it's my discipline, so I'm familiar and I'm comfortable there. Um, so other uh, groups have been looking at the American Historical Association and the American Association for State and Local History and others have been looking to understand how and where Americans um, understand history and how they're interested in it. This particular um, graphic is from this 2020 NEH funded study from the EHA um, that looked at a variety of factors. But one thing I wanna note here is just where the kind of work that I do, nonfiction history books, uh, ranks here in terms of where people get their information about history. It's way down there. Um, as the authors of a synopsis of the study wrote, what's interesting is if you look at the top there, that visual media is one of the most potent sources of historical information. But the other thing that I thought was interesting in this study is that it's not just the case that people are getting their information about history from, um, uh, from sources such as television or film or social media or news, um, but rather um, that people who are being asked about how significant history is um, actually weighed history as just as important as other professional programs like engineering. I'm not saying this doesn't put me out of step in my point about history versus medicine. Um, I'm just noting <laughs> that when the question was asked um, and the survey uh, construction uh, was designed not to ask how important is history, but talk about history relative to other factors. Uh, Humanities for All, which is um, another fantastic project of the Humanities Alliance, um, shows thousands and thousands of projects nationwide, many of which have um, uh, digital components, which, um, and I put the, um, put the link down in the corner of the slide there, um, loads of resources where uh, places where communities, scholars, um, museum professionals, librarians are coming together to create projects on um, various subjects from language to history, to poetry, to whatever. Um, and this uh, is a fantastic resource, I think, of uh, digital and online um, and uh, projects and really makes that case about how broad and deep American engagement with the humanities is. I didn't reference here the humanities indicators um, recent report on the humanities in American life. I've written about that for Scholarly Kitchen, um, but that uh, survey that they did really showed just how profoundly the humanities saturate American experiences. So while we might feel that the humanities are in a crisis in universities where we see degrees dropping, certainly um, we see uh, hiring of new faculty in the humanities, absolutely diving. It's unbelievably terrible, terrible situation. We also see the humanities uh, thriving in other parts 
of the world, of our world here. I'm focused on, on the United States, but we see the humanities thriving in other, in other places. So let's pause again for a moment here. The humanities, if it's not a subject, but a mode, it's about complexity and context and interconnectedness. The humanities isn't about solutions per se, but about greater understanding. And that may seem not of immediate use. I'm sorry to be picking on the business majors here. I have some very good friends who teach in business schools. But, um, but in that sense that maybe the humanities are not of immediate use, but a business degree could be of immediate use. The humanities don't seek to be about solutions, but about greater understanding, which has its own utility. But it's a long-term investment. It's the long-term investment in understanding. I was really struck, um, I know many of us are reading as much as we can about Eastern Europe right now. I was just really struck by this, um, a piece by Ann Applebaum in the Atlantic just last week. And this quote from uh, the late president of Estonia about um, the freedom of economy and trade, the freedom of the mind of culture and science inseparably interconnected, forming the prerequisite of a viable democracy. What struck me here was not only this point about how we understand the relationship of inquiry and knowledge to democracy and to the health of democracy, but that we see how important these different domains of knowledge are inseparably interconnected. And it's not just, you know, humanists who think that. I think scientists think that too, if we give folks the opportunity. So, um, many of us are familiar, probably most of us are familiar with um, Sophia Noble's algorithms of oppression and the kind of research that historians and other scholars of technology have undertaken to demonstrate um, how very um, uh, human algorithms are, how non-neutral technology is, how technology developed by humans conveys the same biases, sometimes exacerbate the same biases that humans hold. In other words, scholars outside of technology necessary to come in and to observe what's very, very human about technology. Um, I think that, you know, that work has been so profound and it's become a kind of shorthand for why it is that technology really requires a humanistic perspective. One of my kids would say, this is the wisdom of Jurassic Park, that great um, quote, from Jeff Goldblum, you know, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, in this case, you know, uh, cultivating dinosaurs from uh, DNA samples. They didn't stop to think if they should. I think about that wisdom of Jurassic, Jurassic Park moment as exemplifying the pause that the humanities asks of us. The humanities asks us not just should you, but what if you did? So should you, think about the biases of an algorithm just to extend this metaphor or this analogy, I guess, a little bit more. Um, should you create an algorithm without thinking about the humanistic qualities and biases of it? Um, and what if you did? And what if you didn't? We can see science all around us taking note and making use of the humanities. This was just literally an example from Sunday's New York Times book review. I just happened to open the book review and say, okay, there's a biologist talking about uh, reading works of history and how important it is. Um, you know, I think we all understand that um, many uh, incredibly thoughtful scientists think of themselves as appreciating the humanities and in fact, exploring the humanities for inspiration and information. I was raised by scientists. I can vouch that they're fully rounded humans. <laughs> um, but I do think there is a point at which sometimes we, uh, we think about the humanities and we sometimes might fall into a phrasing about our engagement with the humanities as a luxury. That is that the humanities is maybe okay for kids at elite universities, for example. Or the humanities may be something that someone who is doing science would engage with on the side, but not centrally in the process of their inquiry. And I think we need to consider what that means. 
even in this particular phrasing, this Sunday book review, this was about, you know, what's the most interesting thing you learned from a book recently? This was the question that elicited the answer about Andrea Wolf's book about von Humboldt. It was a question about a book, right? Um, so once you say book, <laughs> you start to invoke what we understand as the very bookish disciplines. It didn't say what's the most interesting thing you've learned recently. What's something you've learned that really made you stop and think? There was a kind of evocation there that might have brought forth a humanities answer. And maybe my example isn't perfect here, but I do think we need um, more than a kind of luxury or sidebar or only after we've taken care of medicine, thinking about the humanities. I'm not saying that the humanities is instrumental, but I am saying that I believe that the humanities brings us a great deal. So I'm not alone in that. Um, I want to point to two examples here in both um, the medical humanities and in, um, and in engineering. The medical humanities is a kind of extraordinary multidisciplinary development. Many of us will be familiar with the medical humanities um, in part because um, there are now whole journals. Um, this happens to be a BMJ journal. I should have looked further to see what I could find on Muse. I meant to do that this morning in the medical humanities. I can think of books in the medical humanities that are on Muse, um, but I did love this cover too. Um, uh, by 2011, uh, you know, two thirds of medical schools in the United States were requiring at least a course in the medical humanities. And a recent study, was super interesting by 2019 study, suggested that medical students wanted more medical humanities courses earlier in their curriculum. That is, they wanted it in the first three years of the medical curriculum. Um, they didn't, um, in this particular study, they didn't see it as wasting time or slowing them down or stopping them getting to the real medical stuff. Rather, they thought, no, no, I, I, really, I, really, want, uh, I really want this. So um, what's interesting is what administrators who were talking about the medical humanities were saying, both in um, some pieces that I was reading about the, um, uh, the early uh, 2011 uh, study and uh, in this more recent study. And one word they consistently used was empathy. The students talked about how they had increased empathy for their patients and increased empathy for the families of their patients and the communities that their patients lived in. And administrators talked about how they found their students to be more effective because they were more empathetic. They had an improved bedside manner, literally, um, from taking humanities courses. I found that really interesting. Um, it certainly extends the point about the humanities increasing human understanding connecting us. But it's interesting to note that almost the same thing is happening in engineering. So, uh, you know, I, I was just looking for an example of, um, uh, you know, engineering and the humanities. And there's, you know, there's, there's, there are things you can find. <laughs> um, engineering tends to stick to engineering. Um, but I did notice that last year, the National uh, Academy of Engineering made this award to David Kelly for his work um, in design thinking. Um, and that uh, both Kelly's own um, recounting of what design thinking means and how it improves engineering and, um, and, the, uh, uh, and the, um, the, uh, the, the call out for his, uh, for his prize mentioned empathy, the importance of um, design thinking as creating empathy. Now, what Kelly goes on to say in some of his longer remarks on design thinking, which is pretty well established now, um, you know, he's been working on that for uh, decades, um, but what he, what he emphasizes is what we might call uh, user experience, actually. Um, so when he talks about design thinking, he's, and he's describing what the outcome is, he's often talking about UX, how to better understand the user, how to get a better product, uh, engineered product, um, out of your, um, out of your research and your design. So I was struck by that, um, that use of the word empathy, both in the medical humanities and in engineering and thinking, is that what the humanities offers is empathy. Usually I think about the humanities as bringing 
again, context, complexity, interconnectedness. Many of you may know those memes that run around on social media, or maybe I'm just um, vulnerable to them, but that say that, you know, you ask a historian, you know, well, what happened when? And the first thing they'll say is, well, it's complicated, you know, and you know that meme of the guy with a red string all over the um, bulletin boards, right? Um, and, you know, that, uh, that, that meme goes around a lot and people find it funny and yeah, ouch, it's a little painful. But, you know, I've started to think, maybe I'm feeling contrary, but I've started to think, no, that's good to say that things are complicated, to say that we should encourage people to think about how things are complicated, how things take place in a certain context. That's good. We should be supporting people to do that. So I'm not sure what I think about the humanities as offering empathy, um, as offering kind of um, doctors becoming more empathetic, engineers becoming more empathic to um, to the users of, of their products. I'm not sure what I think about that. I wanna mention one last Hopkins context, which is related here to thinking about the medical humanities, which is that um, some of you will know uh, Hopkins project in hard histories, which is Hopkins dealing with its history of race and racism. And in this morning, I read um, uh, an account of a conference that's happening at Hopkins in early May on race and racism in the medical school. And there was a reflection in this account um, from uh, doctors who had been present in the segregated um, uh, hospital zones of Hopkins Hospital in the 1950s and up through the 1970s. That's information actually. And is that information that if a medical student had would make them more empathetic or would it make them more aware of the context in which they operate? That is that they themselves operate within biased context, that they themselves are operating within a context of a place that has a history of bias and discrimination that has impacted people's access to healthcare that has impacted, in fact, their health outcomes. I don't know. So I feel ambivalent about empathy as the utility that the humanities offer to the sciences. So where does this leave us? I don't know, <laughs> honestly. I think um, what it leaves me in this very difficult year, in this very difficult time, um, and you know, I find myself in an extraordinarily happy and privileged position. So when I say it's a difficult year, I wanna be clear about uh, ranges of difficulty, ranges of challenge. Um, but I think that notion of the humanities as offering a pause is in some ways a gift of pandemic, which has required all of us to pause a bit. We've had to stop traveling. We've had to stay home a lot more. Sometimes we're all working from home as I am today, um, but that, gift of a pause to appreciate complexity, to appreciate context, to underscore interconnectedness. I'm going to take that as a positive. I want to just end here, of course, by noting National Library Week. That's just that slide is not relevant to what I'm saying. It's just my <laughs> it's just my emphatic appreciation for the libraries. But I want to just say that the work that all of you are doing as publishers, as librarians, bringing your talent, your expertise, your time and energy to bear on collective efforts to valuing complexity, to insisting on context, to making space and time for interconnections across knowledge domains really, really matters. I'm grateful to be part of this community and I'm looking forward to any comments and questions. Thank you, Karen. I learned so much. That was really inspiring. Um, you know, the, it is, sometimes disheartening to hear some of those statistics, but I still end up feeling still inspired to be working in humanities and to be, you know, a humanist myself. So um, let's, I do, I, let's start off. I do actually have a question while we're, we're waiting for the audience um, to kind of populate some more questions for us. So, you know, what do we as individuals, what can we do to promote the human, humanities? So I occasionally teach a class um, in humanities and popular culture at a community college. And not surprisingly, the majority of my students are wanting to be engineers or business majors, and they don't want to take the class. <laughs> and, you know, what do I do to um, 
you know, to, to get them to embrace the humanities coursework is something that's critical for their future careers, not just, you know, thinking that those, those classes are, are not necessary for what they want to do for their future. Mm-hmm. What can we more as individuals do to, to promote the humanities? Well, um, well, first of all, I love that you're teaching in a community college. That's so great. The great, I mean, the great engine of American economic progress, I think, is the community college. Um, uh, multiple generations of my family have um, appreciated community colleges. And I think I have a kid upstairs right now taking a class online at community college okay. as we speak. <laughs> as we speak. Um, so I think, um, you know, one thing I have appreciated borrowing from engineering is just systems thinking. Mm -hmm. which I think is actually in some ways as or more relevant for the humanities as than it is for engineering. Um, When we think about like the context we're in right now, we know that we're here as an accumulation of past actions and decisions. And that's exactly what systems thinking is Um, that, you know, if, um, if, if, if engineers want the practical aspect of the humanities, in part, it's that. It's thinking, how do you know where you are right now in this moment? You know it because you have processed the system. And as a good engineer, you know you have to think both backwards. How is this? How am I going to get to this point with whatever it is that I'm designing? And how am I, how am I going to move it forward? Um, and that's really what the humanities offers us too, is thinking about context, thinking about broader systems. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know that analogies are always the answer. Um, you know, I always wonder whether, um, one thing that's actually important for all of us to do is just to appreciate that the work we're doing is, um, is significant, Mm -hmm. um, and that it really does play a role, um, in this moment, in this incredible period where we're so aware of how political fortunes change so seemingly rapidly and yet actually have accumulated over time how authoritarianism is rising and democracy is an action verb. It's not a noun. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, just reflecting on the fact that we invest ourselves, all of us, everyone who is here today invests ourselves um, in humanities knowledge. And that really matters. It really, really matters. Yep. That's great. And thinking, you know, I think there's a lot of conversation about, um, you know, humanities plus or interdisciplinariness. Like what, how do you feel about that? Where do you, do you think that is something that is going to take the field in a, in a direction that will kind of help kind of bridge that gap between the engineers and the humanists? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking today about, um, about general education, actually, in a more kind of mechanistic um, curricular sort of way. And the rise of general education in the 1960s, and then the kind of attacks on general education and distributed requirements and how we've come to understand, you know, why people should take um, and should be exposed to subjects um, in different areas. And, you know, I'm at Brown now where students don't have that obligation at all. Students can take whatever they want, actually. And it's amazing. And you actually, we tend to have more students who are math majors taking history or science, whatever they, because they don't have major requirements in the same way and they don't have distributed requirements in the same way. I don't think that's a generalizable model, but I do think that one thing that has happened and it's a long way around to answer your question about humanities Mm -hmm. plus is that um, it certainly makes everyone more aware of the artificiality of how we divide knowledge. Um, I mean, you know, just talking about the humanities here. I mean, in many ways, I think STEM is very humanities. You know, it is these science is a human product. I know that we're supposed to think that science derives from the natural laws of the universe, which are immutable, et cetera. But we are the ones interpreting that. We are the ones who have described that. We are the ones who have declared that we understand that knowledge now. And of course, then we understand it differently in 10 years and so on and so on and so on. Um, But I think, you know, just that sense that it's not just it's it's not just humanities plus it's really knowledge is um holistic um we divide it up to understand it but that doesn't mean that knowledge itself isn't holistic it is i think that's great so we've got a lot of questions that are coming in so i'm going to go to the question board here (laughs) um i'm so i'm hoping these are comments rather than questions because i'm (laughs) betting there's going to be so much smart commentary out there so i'm looking forward to that uh, so let's see, um, what would you say to students who feel pressure to get STEM or business degrees? 
Mm, okay, that's great. That's a super great question. Mm -hmm. So I would say two things. One, I would say um, the first of all, the statistics do not support that um, that earnings power is greater either in STEM or business. It it just doesn't. Um, and uh, that uh, I think I quote. I think I had on one of the slides. Johan Neem has a piece that called, it's called kill the business major, sorry, but it is, but he summarizes really nice. Johan is a very, very thoughtful interpreter of the history of higher education. And when he writes for the Chronicle, he puts some really great material, but he's summarized um, the studies that show, you know, kind of, okay, so what are the, um, what are the dollar differentials in different, um, in different areas um, and, and over time? Um, and they're just much smaller than you might think. So that's one thing. The second thing is, um, you know, I there is also good literature saying that uh, businesses, when they're looking to hire, are really interested in hiring people who have really good writing skills. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of my former board members at the Omohundro Institute, um, Paul Sperry, who's a fantastic person as well as a businessman, has spoken at the Organization of American Historians. He's just spoken at something for the ACLS. But he is fantastically eloquent on the point that he only ever looks, he's a banking guy, he only ever looks to hire humanities majors because he's like, I want them to write reports. I want them to write persuasive memos. I want them to summarize material. I want, this is what I want. I want people who can read, analyze, and write. And I'm going to hire humanities majors for that. Um, so I would say for kids who think, who feel pressured, um, you know, share the information with them. You know, there is information here. The other thing is, I just think, let's put a little humanities process to work as we're responding to students, which is to back it out and say to them, look, there's a context to this. You know, <laughs> there have been a couple of decades here of emphasis on practical degrees. And there have been a couple decades where college has gotten so expensive that no wonder your parents are worried. No wonder they are responding completely rationally out of love and care for your future. But let's put it in a little bit of context and think about what that, what that context is. Great. Um, your comment about empathy made me wonder if public advocacy for the humanities needs to be reconsidered. What do you think? Are we using the right language in our advocacy? Mm -hmm. So there are, um, you know, expert advocates for the humanities, um, you know, the Humanities Alliance folks who organize um, a Humanities Day um, mm -hmm. are really, I, I can't say enough about the work they do. So I am speaking off the cuff and not as an expert in language because they've actually looked at this, you know, they've done studies on how do you speak about this. The American Association for State and Local History, for example, has just done a study on how to engage people with history and and they have what they're calling a framework toolbox where they want people to give up talking about history um, in certain kinds of ways, including some of the ways that I do, um, and start talking about history more as a kind of de detective process because it engages people in the kind of process of finding out. Um, so there are folks who are really looking at that. My own sense is actually, you know, I think what you're hearing from me is that for myself, I want to use that humanities process to talk about the humanities. I want to contextualize and I want to take that pause and say, look, we need to think about this a little more deeply. And there aren't immediate answers for things. Why would there be? For the biggest challenges that we face as individuals or in communities of, you know, people we care about who are struggling or you know, the biggest problems that we have, none of them are simple. So of course, I don't have a simple answer for you about you know, what happened in X period or Y period, of course not. So pausing, contextualizing, and appreciating that humanities process, that's what, that's what I do. And because my parents are engineers, I, I, I steal the systems thinking <laughs> analogy too. <laughs> so. um, we have another question, kind of taking this, this topic always seems to come up when we're talking about humanities. Um, the question is, many early career humanists face a complex publishing choices in the publish or perish environments. Uh, yeah. What can institutions do to support not-for-profit and other ethical publishing systems? Big yeah. question. <laughs> a huge question and mm -hmm. such a great one. And I just want to say, pause, 
that must be my word of the day, but to appreciate how you said nonprofit ethical publishing. I love that. And, um, you know, I've had a lot to say over the last years about open access and how monolithic science-based open access, APC, you know, article, uh, mm-hmm. author processing charges based um, open access is no kind of, it's not open and it's not accessible. It's a kind of trap essentially that drowns out nonprofit um, work and has distracted scholars from understanding the really ethical and collaborative work that nonprofit publishers do. So one thing is, um, I'm just going to go back to saying that I, when I talk to um, early career scholars, I always want to say to them, understand the business models. And I'm not asking you to get into the 990s or something on these <laughs> businesses. I'm asking you to think about if you're publishing with this place, what is the thing that they, what is their business model? Are they relying on making a lot of money out of X and Y? And are they paying that to shareholders? Or is this a nonprofit that plows their money back in? How do you understand the business of this publisher? And is that aligned with your values? Now, for young people who are early career people who are just need to publish, sometimes you don't have time for all of that. You're just like, just, but I feel like the more we can talk about the interconnectedness of research and publishing across all of our work in libraries and archives and publishers and aggregators and all of this work in the humanities, it's so collaborative, so mutual, and it's all necessary for the ultimate production of scholarship. The more we talk about that, and the more we talk about not just that mutual collaborative nature, but if it's essentially nonprofit and ethical nature, the better equipped they will be to make, mm-hmm. I guess what we would say are good choices. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a few, we have quite a few questions actually. I don't know if we're gonna be able to get to them all, but please note uh, if you've put a question in, I will make sure Karen gets the question um, at some point today so she will have them. Um, so a lot of questions more about um, how to kind of help students Um, So this particular question, I think humanities are the center circle and the Venn diagram of social justice, science, and humanities. I would agree with that. Um, I do find trying to teach info literacy and sort of between humanities and science uh, corrupted by politics to be very frustrating. Um, I'm struggling to determine how to instruct students on these topics without being accused of a political agenda. Are there Mm. more resources that you can recommend that could help with this issue? Mm. It's such a great question. Yeah. I mean, you know, so in my discipline, obviously history is um, unbelievably fraught and contested right. and just constant headlines. I mean, actual legislation against teaching historical right. material. Mm-hmm. What? What? Ah. Um, so yeah, that's super fraught. Um, and, you know, and there are teachers who are, um, who are very vulnerable given that this kind of legislation. Um, And I hear that question, which is, how do you address, how do you help students um, to understand what those politics are? And I think, or or I think the question you're, the the person is asking is, um, how do you teach them without making them think that your politics are invading what you're thinking? And I think there's no way to do that. I think the only way to do that is to surface it and say, knowledge is always political, in that, not necessarily, you know, partisan, but knowledge is political because we make choices about what to study, what to prioritize, what we're going to emphasize, who gets access to it, what gets broadcast. I was just doing a talk the other day about, um, uh, all right, I won't get distracted by this, but about how some knowledge is really loud, really, really loud, and some knowledge is really silenced. Mm -hmm. And I think helping students think through that for themselves, of course, knowledge is political. And of course, information is political because knowledge is powerful. When you know more, you make more decisions and different decisions. And you don't always make the ones that I would agree with or your parents would agree with or whatever, but knowledge, of course, it's empowering. So of course it's political, but helping them actually being a little more transparent about it rather than trying to, trying to stay, there's no neutrality, but helping them to see that you can't stay neutral, you know, but if you surface that, I think that's really helpful because that itself is the tool for them. And again, that just like goes back to that such a humanities mode, I think. Right. Um, so kind of in that vein, we have another question, um, under the current environment in which we are sliding to authoritarianism, how do you teach students that winning at all costs is not a good strategy toward their uh, particular field? Mm. 
Hmm, wow. Um, it's so hard because um, not all students are young people, but many students are young. Um, you know, many of us are teaching students who are who have already been in jobs and careers and so on. But many of us are also teaching quite young people. In any case, they're when they come into our classroom, um, they're in a position of um, they're in a new position. They're you know they're in a position to learn, um, and they're so they're they're vulnerable. Um, I think it's such a hard world for them, and it's almost impossible for us to understand what this particular generation of very young adults is experiencing between pandemic and a kind and social media and a kind of cynicism around government of any of all kinds, um, how to teach them that winning at all costs isn't the thing. I don't, I don't know, but what I do know is that what I see among young people, whether it's the kids who are at community college with my kid or whether it's the kids I see on the campus at Brown or that I saw at William and Mary for years, is that um, they have, for the most part, they're incredibly open-minded and the things that they're kind of uptight about are not things that their parents are uptight about at all. They're more open about sexuality. They're more um, open about different political views. I'm astonished by that. I, I, anyway, that's anecdotal. Um, but I think, um, I think they need more than guidance towards a particular way of thinking. I think they need some understanding and I think they need some appreciation for the context they're living in. And I wonder whether just that lowers the, um, kind of lowers the temperature on expectations for them. That drive to like win at all costs is like an anxious thing, right? That's like a, an anxious response. But stepping back to give them time to appreciate and to hear their context may actually just alleviate that impulse at the same time. Yeah, that was um, that was great. That was a great answer. That was a tough question. <laughs> um, so it looks like we have about what time for one more question. Um, and uh, as uh, are we humanists uh, doing ourselves a disservice long-term by emphasizing the practical pragmatic benefits of a humanities-based education, for example, better storytellers over <laughs> arts for art's sake arguments? I love that question. I oh, love that question <laughs> because I feel like, I feel that exactly. I feel like, oh, you know, I, I thought about the, the point about medical humanities and engineering, like do this and it buys you empathy. <laughs> like, you know, I, I was torn about how to how to talk about that. But one thing that does irritate me about that is it just makes the humanities kind of instrumental, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't, I, I agree. I think that um, actually we don't, we want to not say that things are instrumental. You do X and you get Y. You, um, you know, you put in a coin and you get out a toy. Um, it's not, it's not like that. And we don't want people, and just in reference to the previous couple of questions, we don't want students to think about that either. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to think that there's a practical, um, you know, um, output here for humanities. You, you're a better writer. Well, yes. Um, you know, you have better thinking skills or critical thinking skills. Yes. All of these things, your job prospects will not be markedly reduced compared to your friends in biology or whatever. But rather, we want them to think about like education for life, for living, you know, for being a person. Um, and for that, you really want the fullness of knowledge. And yet to say that is also they are in this crush of student debt, a pandemic, you know, all, all of these different contexts. So many, you know, higher number of students than ever before with food insecurity. Um, it's extraordinary. So. So yes, I think we do ourselves a disservice by by um, by talking about the kind of you know trade that you get with the humanities. Here is the benefit, you know. Here's the benny for studying the humanities. Um, but I don't know how to get around that in the current context. Students need something to hang on to. Um, art for art's sake. Um, yes, <laughs> and history for history's sake. And all knowledge for knowledge's sake, because we never know when it's going to come back. We never know when we wish actually that we had kept that Russian language um, program, when we wish that we had taken Russian or that we had supported somebody who wanted to. We don't know that. I, I read a piece from an engineering student at Hopkins, since I've been complimentary to Hopkins, 
and also getting the other side here, but I read an, an op-ed from a Hopkins engineering student saying, look, we take this one class in humanities, we're allowed to take one, um, and then we're not allowed to take anything else. And my advisor told me I shouldn't take languages because it wouldn't help my work as an engineer. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, so you, I mean, but how to teach very young people that you can invest for the long term when they're, they're young, older, maybe, you know, maybe our older students, maybe our, our students who are now um, the majority, students who have been out in the world, maybe they are the ones who can hear us on the humanity for humanity's sake. I've spelled that two different ways in that sentence, <laughs> but maybe they can hear us better. Yep. And that's a, that's the perfect note to, to end on. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Karen, and generously giving your time to kick off News Meets 2022. And thank you to the audience for your participation. I'll make sure Karen gets any of the questions we did not have time to get to. Uh, so we're going to take a 15 minute break um, and we'll be back at 1115 Eastern time for the panel discussion, OA Pathways for the Nonprofit Scholarly Journals Publisher. We'll see you then.